all brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, those of you who we see often and those of you who we don't see that often, I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is my hope and my desire this morning to present to you Christ in all of his saving work, but also Christ in his awesome authority over his church. Our Lord Jesus Christ speaks to his church. Our Lord Jesus Christ has a clear message for his church. And it is my hope and my prayer this morning to set before you Christ and his authority over the church. With that in mind, I'd like to ask you to take your Bibles, please, and turn back to Revelation chapter 2. We've been in this passage of Scripture for some time. We will be in this passage of Scripture for uh, weeks to come. And what I want to do today is I want to take a look uh, at uh, Christ's word, the word of our Lord Jesus Christ to the church at Thyatira. And... In order to set this sermon for you here this morning, I actually want to read to you from two letters. The first letter is the letter of Christ himself to this church, and we'll do that right now. And the second letter I want to read to you this morning is a letter that was written by a Roman governor in the area of Asia Minor, where the church of Thyatira and the seven churches of the book of Revelation were located. Uh, that letter was written in about the year 112 A.D. We'll get to that shortly. But first, and most importantly, the letter of our Lord Jesus Christ to the church at Thyatira. Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. Please hear this letter of Jesus Christ. And unto the angel of the church at Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works in charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the first to be more, and the, I'm sorry, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and the hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will pour, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which ye have already, hold fast till I come. He that overcometh and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he that, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I have received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that hath an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. So much the reading of this letter of our Lord Jesus Christ to this church. As I said before, in about the year 112 AD, a Roman governor by the name of Pliny the Younger wrote a letter to the Roman Emperor Trajan. And he was writing a letter in order to get from the emperor some information as how to deal with this group, this sect, known as Christians, known as those who follow Christ. What to do with these individuals? And the reason why this letter was written was because many Christians at that time, because they would not swear allegiance to Caesar, they would not worship, they would not worship the emperor, many of these Christians were marked for death. And this man, this governor, Pliny, excuse me, Pliny, wanted to know from Trajan how he should approach this. And he writes a letter, and uh, one segment of the letter reads as follows. Meanwhile, in the case of those who were denounced to me as Christians, I have observed the following procedure. I interrogated these as to whether or not they were Christians. Those who confessed, I interrogated a second and a third time, threatening them with punishment. Those who persisted, I ordered, executed. For I had no doubt that, whatever the nature of their creed, stubbornness and inflexible obstinacy surely deserved to be punished. There were others possessed of the same folly, but because they were Roman citizens, I signed an order for them to be transferred to Rome. 
So he's writing, this, he's writing this letter to the emperor to see how to deal with these Christians. And the emperor responds back, and he responds in a number of ways. Number one, he says, again, that these Christians, if they persist in their, in their failure to worship the emperor, they were to be put to death. He says other things by way of the fact that they should not, uh, that, the, uh, uh, that Pliny should not receive uh, any unfounded accusations against those uh, who claim to be Christians. But if they indeed are accused of being Christians and fail to recant their faith in Christ, then the, then the decree for them was execution. It's interesting as this letter goes on that uh, Pliny uh, gives to us something of a description of the early church. And I want to point some things out to you here because I think they are germane to, to what we are doing here this morning. Pliny writes as follows. They assert, however, that the sum and substance of their error had been, first, that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and to sing responsi responsibly a hymn to Christ as to God and to bind themselves by oath, not to some crime, but not to commit fraud, theft, or adultery, not to falsify their trust, nor to refuse or re to return a trust when called upon. And when this was over, it was their custom to depart and to assemble again to partake of their food, but ordinary and innocent food. Even this they affirmed that they had ceased to do after my edict, which, in accordance with your instructions, I had for forbidden political associations. Well, he goes on. What I want to bring to your attention is this. This Roman governor marks the Christians by three specific features. Number one, they publicly gathered in the name of Christ to worship. They gathered publicly. They did what you and I are doing here this day. That was the mark, the hallmark of the early Christian church. Yes, we thank God for the times that we have in the privacy of our own home to worship God, to read his word, maybe to sing hymns to his name. Oh, but the people of Christ, that they would gather in the name of Christ on the day that Christ is given to be worshipped. That's what marked them. The second thing, if you notice, is that they were marked by holiness of life. There was no public scandal that they were seeking to do. They were not trying to, to undermine the, uh, the, uh, the, the authority of the, of the civil rulers, but they were seeking to be obedient to Christ in all things, and they were doing that by way of, uh, by way of the elements of personal holiness in their conduct. And then thirdly, there was that Christian fellowship that they had one with another. I bring these two letters to you because I want you to see and I want you to understand that in many ways... The decisions that had to be made in that first century are decisions that still have to be made in our day. You and I must determine before God and before a watching world to whom we will be faithful. You and I must determine before a watching world and sometimes a persecuting world whose faith will we claim, whose name will we claim, to whom will we render, yes, ultimate obedience. And you see from this passage of Scripture and from this letter that oftentimes there is a conflict and in that conflict, where will you, where will, I, will, I, will, where will I stand? Well, I want to remind you of something here this morning. You must understand, I see it as my, as, my, as my most essential duty for which I am eternally responsible before God to call you to the worship of Jesus Christ both publicly and privately, to call you to faith and allegiance to Christ above all things, to press upon you the claims of Christ, to set before you the hope of the gospel of Jesus Christ, to call you to understand that whatever Christ sets upon you by way of calling and by way of demand, he will give you grace by way of his spirit to fulfill, to fulfill these things. And I say that because in our day, there is so much by way of the professing church of Christ that will have none of this. So much by way of the professing church of Christ that will find itself very easily accommodating the world as opposed to standing fast for Christ. Now I bring these things out to you here this morning, particularly because of what we see in this letter that Christ writes to Thyatira. This letter, again, we've been dealing with these letters, we've been looking at these letters in these past weeks, and one of the things that we find, have found bubbling up to the surface is that there was a form of teaching that the churches in that day were beginning to, uh, to, to, to hold on to. And that form of teaching, you remember, was marked by three specific groups. You remember, those who taught the doctrine of Balaam, those, again, who were known as the Nicolaitans, and now this morning we'll see those who are the followers of Jezebel. In each of these groups, while there were things uh, uh, distinct to each of them, the primary thing that drew them all together was their teaching 
and their willingness to accommodate the culture in order to avoid persecution from the world. And because of this, there was a severe defection from Christ. And Christ shows up to each and every one of these churches. He shows up with a letter. He shows up in a specific, by, by way of a specific character of his nature. And he calls the church to repent where repentance is needed. And he calls the church for faithfulness and for overcoming as is needed in every situation. And so what I want to do here this morning is I want to, I want to engage this uh, passage of scripture. Not so much as we normally do trying to kind of capture the entire epistle. We're not going to do that this morning. What I want to try to do, to attempt to do, is I want to attempt to capture what I believe is the essence, the main thrust that our Lord Jesus Christ is making to the church of Thyatira. And it is essentially this. It is that call to deal with Jezebel and her damnable doctrine that she is bringing into the church. And so what I hope to do with you this morning is set before you that specific point. We're going to take a look at some of the, some of the features that surround uh, this, uh, this, uh, this uh, teaching that was being engaged. We're going to take a look at uh, the Church of Thyatira just in general. We may come back to this uh, in weeks to come. One of the things that we have to notice just by way of observation, the letter to the Church of Thyatira is the longest of all the seven letters. There's much, as, as we've seen in many cases, there's much that's commendable there. And as a matter of fact, there's a sense in which our Lord Jesus Christ is heaping up commend commendation on the church. But he says, I have this one thing against thee. And that's something that we have seen in, in every one of these churches going forward so far, except for the church at Sardis. There is something that Christ has against the church. And you have to understand how significant this is. This is not something that Christ is saying. It's a mere, it's a, it's a, it's a mere foible. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slight. No, he says, I have this against you. And that's why he says, he that has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. Well, if I were to sum up what I'm going to attempt to do today, I would say that it's essentially along these lines. While Christ has brought his people into spiritual communion and covenant blessings, he will not ignore sins that lead to or involve immorality and idolatry. If these sins exist in the church, he will call for repentance. He will give opportunity for repentance. But if repentance is refused, he will righteously, severely, and discriminatingly bring judgment upon the church. Righteously, severely, and discriminatingly bring judgment upon the church. Why do I say these things righteously, uh, severely, and discriminatingly? Because, again, his judgment here is always a righteous judgment. His, righteous here, his judgment here, in this case, is very severe. Did you notice there, I believe it was in verse 21, I will, I will, I will kill her children? This is severe. This, the judgment threatened here is, is, is again, is, it, it, it's, it most, it's the most severe that we've seen up to this point. But it will be a discriminating judgment. It is the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who comes to this church with eyes like fire. He can make these discriminating judgments, you see. He knows who are his followers and, and who are following these, 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 damnable, these damnable doctrines. And he will make a discriminating judgment. This is again brought to our attention under that image as having feet like on the fine polished brass. This is the symbol of judgment. And so we're going to take a look at all these things. Now, as I said before, we're not going to follow our normal procedure uh, by way of working through the text, uh, you know, line by line, as it were. But what I want to do, as I said, I want to kind of get to the centerpiece of the letter. And I want to develop that. And I want to do that, as I said before, because... I think it's important that we hear this message, number one, but I also think that we, if, we, if we center on this message, we will have an introduction to the table of the Lord, which is very, very important for us here this morning. You see, this morning we have before us the Lord's table. We will be participating in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, not by way of any physical transference of substance, but by way of an identification with Jesus Christ and his death for our sins, we will be truly entering into spiritual communion with Christ. And there is a sense in which what the scriptures teaches over and over again is that you and I have true spiritual fellowship with Christ at the table. Does this kind of give any indication as to why our Lord Jesus Christ insists that the church cannot have anything to do with idolatry? which would bring them into spiritual communion. 
with demons and devils, as Paul says in the King James in 1 Corinthians 10. There is a spiritual reality that is set before us here this morning. There, the, there, are, there, there, are, there, there are spiritual uh, uh, issues that we are dealing with here this morning. And we must proceed along the lines that Christ lays, that Christ lays out for us. And so what we're going to do here this morning is we're going to take a look. I'll give a general overview of the epistle that our Lord writes here. Excuse me, that our Lord writes here. I'll, I'll bring mention to the, those things that are commendable. I'll mention those things which, are, which he critiques. And then we're going to focus specifically on, again, this issue with Jezebel as it's presented to us here. So the first thing I want you to see by way of this passage of Scripture is who it is that writes this letter. By now you know that every time that our Lord Jesus Christ pens one or has one of these uh, letters written to the church, he does it in a way that sets before that particular church characteristics and features that are unique to his ministry to that church and unique to the issues that are going on in that church. And in this particular church, the only time that we see our Lord Jesus Christ mentioned as the Son of God in the book of Revelation is in this place right here. And what we're going to see here, and the, 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 the implication of that, is that whatever the Roman emperor may, may assume to himself, it is Jesus Christ who is the true and only Son of God. Our Lord Jesus Christ, when he, when he presents himself to the church with the eyes that are like a flame of fire, this is his penetrating gaze. This is his discerning look. This is his ability to see within the heart of man and be able to determine where true allegiance lies. And our Lord Jesus Christ, again, coming with the, with the feet is polished brass. The idea here being brass being the symbol of judgment. He is able to bring judgment. So our Lord Jesus Christ comes to that church in these characteristics. You remember when we dealt with the church at Pergamos, how we said that our Lord Jesus Christ, he shows up to that church as the one who has the sharp two-edged sword in his hand. He came with a sword to that church. It was very, sometimes it was, it was somewhat difficult to get our minds around it. But we saw that our Lord Jesus Christ was saying to that church, even though it was the center of emperor worship in Asia Minor, Jesus Christ was reminding the church that he was the one who held the power of the sword. He was the one who held the issues of life and death. He was the one, again, that was able to make this discriminating judgment. And so our Lord Jesus Christ comes to these churches. Oh, how would our Lord Jesus Christ pen a letter to our little congregation this morning? To the, church, to the church of Nauset and East Ham, how would he write it? How would he present himself to us? You see, again, these things, these questions linger in our minds, do they not? And so here is our Lord Jesus Christ presenting himself to the church. These, these, these issues, these, these qualities that our Lord uses to present himself to the church will become very, very significant as the letter unfolds. Because once again, our, our Lord Jesus Christ, you, when, he, when he speaks about the things that have to be critiqued and he speaks about the things that, that require judgment, it's not indiscriminate judgment that he's going to bring. It's a discriminating judgment. And on all those who, 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 who fall in and, and who follow the, the teachings of Jezebel, the teaching of those who allow for this sinful accommodation with the practices of society, our Lord Jesus Christ says he comes in judgment. Oh, you see, these things are very, very serious that are in front of us. Well, so again, let me just point out to you verse uh, 20 here. As I, and I, and as I have said, I would suggest to you that the thing that we see here in verse 20 is really the primary matter of the passage. Verse 20, notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now you remember when our Lord Jesus Christ called out uh, uh, those who were holding to the, the doctrine of, uh, of Balaam, it was the same idea, seduction and, and, and idolatry, immorality and idolatry. You remember when we discussed the, the whole issue of the nature of the teaching of the Nicolaitans, it was, it was the same thing. It was a group of individuals who were teaching uh, this idea that, that, you could, uh, that you could kind of cooperate with the larger culture, be a part of the practices that were degrading, excuse me, <clears throat> that were degrading and that were idolatrous, and you can still maintain your walk with Christ. And our Lord Jesus Christ comes and he says that this is not the case. This must be repented of. And this reminds us, does it not, that the, that the primary feature of the Christian life is an exclusive and undying faithfulness to Christ himself. 
That there is a sense in which when, when you were saved by the grace of God and brought into the saving communion, communion with Jesus Christ, that you were brought into an exclusive relation with him. That there was a sense in which you claimed Christ to be Lord above all earthly kings or powers. That you claimed that you would give to Christ a love that exceeded an even love for your own blood and family. That there was a sense in which Christ would be the ruling factor in everything that you did. All of your affections, all of your thinking, all of everything about you was all bound up in the person of Christ. You've not forgotten that, have you? This is why the apostle, this is why our Lord Jesus Christ says to that church at Ephesus, which by the way, the more I read of these other churches, that church of Ephesus was a good church except for that one thing. But what was that one thing? They lost their first love. And so again, I exhort and I remind you here this morning, oh, what is your love for Christ like this morning? Will your love for Christ lead you everywhere where Christ calls you to go? I hope and I pray that it is. If I don't press upon you that reality, I am failing before God to do what he's put me in this pulpit to do. You see, again, these, 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 these Balaamites, these Nicolaitans, these followers of Jezebel, what they did is they broke down the barriers that Christ placed around his church as a people in covenant with him. Yes, these barriers. You see, these, these identifying marks of, of the people of God as the very sheep that Christ has called to himself, those very sheep that Christ has purchased with his own blood. John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. You see, again, the love that Christ has set upon you, the love that Christ has set upon his church. What is the mark of being a sheep? What is the mark of being uh, this, uh, this one who's included in the flock of Christ? Jesus puts it very simply. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. And if Christ shows up at a church and says certain things are commendable and certain things must be left off, the sheep of Jesus Christ do exactly what he says. It reminds us again of why Paul said in Acts chapter 20, uh, verses 28 through 31, when he says to the Ephesian elders there, he says, Take heed to yourselves, therefore, and to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers, to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. Do you understand the cost that was paid for your soul? To feed the church of God. The, 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 again, these, these Ephesian elders, overseers, having responsibility, having accountability, not to a congregation, but accountability before to, uh, to Jesus Christ. Paul goes on to say, For this I know, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And also of your own self shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw, thing, to draw disciples away after them. Therefore, we watch and remember that by the space of three years, I cease not to warn every one of you night and day with tears. Here was this apostle Paul pleading with these, with these Christians. Oh, follow Christ. Love Christ above all things. Be faithful to him. Hear his word. Understand that when I call you to these things, I do it because this is what Christ has commanded me to do, the apostle says. And what was happening here in each one of these churches that were, that were imbibing this, this doctrine, whether it was of the Nicolaitans, the Nicolaitan type, or the, or the type of Balaam, Balaam kind of doing these things for personal gain, or whether it was from the perspective of, of Jezebel uh, doing these things, they were all breaking down these barriers. They all, each of them allowed for participation in the broader culture that was spiritually fatal to the church and to its members. And again, you might remember those of you that were have been with us in these last few weeks. You remember how we tried to set this out in a, in, a, in, a, in a very tangible way, as it were. You remember, there they were at Pergamos, the center of, of emperor worship. And the, the, great, the great challenge was, would this group of, of this, this, what was thought to be by the emperor, this subsect of Judaism, would they, would, would, they, uh, would, would they go along with everything that was supposed to, uh, supposed to be done in the culture? And you might remember... And there was that reference to the synagogue of Satan there in the, in the church of Sardis. And the idea was this, is that there were those who were, who were Jews who were making sure that the civil authorities knew that these Christians were none of us. These Christians were, and, and the reason why that was being done is because the Jews were given a, a, a certain a status and having to make some adjustments in their outward uh, allegiance to the emperor. 
There was a sense in which they were allowed uh, to, to have this, uh, this little dispensation where they didn't have to uh, swear that same type of allegiance. But once the Roman authorities knew that the Christians were not Jews, the Jewish synagogue began to inform the authorities of this, and pressure came upon the professing church. And our Lord Jesus says to that church, you hold fast, and you overcome. You see, I'm the one who has supreme authority in the church. I'm the one who has supreme authority over all things. And so what the Balaamites and what the, and what the doctrine of the Nicolaitans were saying was essentially this. You know, you really don't need to take that strong of a stance. Is, is, is it going to be that detrimental to your faith to just once a year make a public act of allegiance to the emperor and then you're free to do what you want? Oh, the subtlety of these arguments. The challenge of these arguments. We face them in our own day. And in a sense, the, the church of Pergamos faced everything by way of the, civil, the power of the state against the, against the church and against the individual. And unless the individual did everything it, what, the, what the state was demanding, there would be great trouble. And now for the Christian church, it all revolved around their stand with Jesus Christ. That's why that letter of Trajan Written in 112, probably 20 years after the, after the, uh, after the, uh, the book of Revelation was written. W what do I do with these Christians? They're, they're not tearing the place up. They're not acting, you know, they're not acting crazy. They're actually pretty good citizens. What do I do with them? And again, ultimate allegiance had to be sworn. You come now to Thyatira. And Thyatira is kind of interesting. Each of the cities that we've looked at prior to this, they were kind of if I can say it this way, kind of impressive in their own right, these cities. Ephesus was a very important city in the ancient world. The same thing with uh, Sardis. Certainly Pergamos was, uh, again, the center of emperor worship. Each of them had something of a sophistication, or what we might call a cosmopolitan kind of a flair. Thyatira was not that city. Thyatira is what we would call in our days something of a blue-collar town. Uh, there was pretty much a, 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 a gathering or a, its, a, its identification was made up of artisans and, uh, and, and craftsmen. Uh, and the one feature about the church of Thyatira that begins to impact this letter here is that Thyatira, as a place of artisans and craftsmen, Thyatira was a, uh, was, a, was a city that was known for its ancient trade guilds. And those trade guilds are where kind of we get our modern day trade unions from. And to belong to a trade guild, trade guild was, was necessary. You really could not work your profession or your trade apart from belonging to a guild. You might remember that Lydia in the Book of Acts was from Thyatira. She was a seller of purple. That was one of the guilds that were there in that city. And as with so much in the ancient world, this city of Thyatira, with its trade guilds, guilds, required that individuals participate in the guild, and they participate in the acts of public and pagan worship. Now, you must remember in this series, I'm not using the word pagan in something of a demeaning sense, like, oh, you, you know, you're just a rank pagan. I'm not using that. It was the accepted religion of the day. And that accepted religion of the day, again, permeated society. There was no real separation of, of, of religious things from, from civil things, from personal things. And so to belong to this trade guild, each, each guild, while it would, while it would, while it would submit or, or, or show ultimate allegiance to the emperor, it had the, each trade guild had its own small g god. And there would be feasts in honor of that god. And in those feasts, what would happen is that there would be all the debauchery that would go along with what was known in the, in the Gentile world. You remember I read that passage of scripture uh, to you uh, last week from uh, 1 Peter uh, chapter 3, where uh, in that passage of scripture, uh, Peter says, again, 1 Peter chapter 3 verses, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 4 verses 3 through 5, and I'll read this from the NIV, make it a little bit, uh, kind of a little easier to grasp here. Peter writes this. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. 
They think it's strange that you, not, that you do not plunge with them into the same flood of dissipation. And they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. You might remember that last week when I dealt with that passage of scripture, I said that I had always read that passage of scripture kind of in the context of our own day. Where in a secular society, you have individuals just giving over to all kind of licentiousness, living ways of uh, just giving itself, just, just the ind individuals giving themselves over to the flesh. Much that would mark present day culture, much that would mark entertainment. But Peter's writing this in the context of the pagan religion. It was the idolatry and the feast that went along with it that Peter was saying, look, you're, you're getting a hard time for not going along with those idolatrous practices. And you need to understand that this is something that you cannot go along with. That's why also another passage of Scripture is very important here. That passage of Scripture in, in uh, Acts chapter 15, verses 28 through 29. You remember the decree of the Jerusalem Council? What to do with these Gentiles who were coming to faith in Christ? Are we to impose upon them the law of Moses? And the, and, the, and the church said essentially, no, we're not to impose upon them the law of Moses, but we are to make sure that they understand this. Acts 15, 28. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and us not to lay upon you no greater burden than the necessary things, that ye abstain from meats offered to idols and from blood and from things strangled and from fornication, which if ye keep yourselves from, ye shall do well. And the point in that passage of scripture is this. Don't be involved in the idolatrous pagan feast because of the immorality that of necessity was attached to them. And the Christian cannot be a partaker of these things. Well, it's one thing to say that in our day when there are no necessary repercussions for saying no to practices that are ultimately offensive to God and that jeopardize our identification with Christ. But if your standing in civil society depended upon your swearing allegiance to, to, to the governor, to, to the president, and say, rather than Christ is Lord, to say Caesar is Lord, that's a much different situation, isn't it? And there were these teachers that were coming into the church and saying, okay, look, it's, you can do this. You have liberty. You're free in Christ. Somebody shouldn't put you under those kind of restrictions. But Christ comes to the church and what does he say? No, that's not the case. The interesting thing about Pergamos is that Pergamos by way of its challenge, dealt with life and death, as it were. Thyatira, the, 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 the challenge is a little different. Not as, not as maybe as challenging, or maybe, I should say it that way, not as maybe uh, uh, as uh, frightening as life and death, but as challenging as, oh, you can't work here because you don't, you're not a part of the guild. You can be a part of the guild, we're going to have our guild meeting next Monday night. We're going to have our little thing. We do a little thing to our, you know, God, and we have a little feast after it, and we swear allegiance to the God, and, you know, you could be a part of it. So I can't be, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. I can't be a part of that. Hmm. Okay. Whatever. What if you couldn't go to work tomorrow because of your allegiance to Christ? And the challenge for these churches was that each of those groups the Balaamites, the Nicolaitans, Jezebel, were all saying to these churches, you can accommodate the world in this regard. You can go along and you can give your sacrifice to the pagan deity. You can identify publicly with your allegiance to Caesar. And when our Lord Jesus Christ deals with these things, he says, such is not the case. It's interesting because when you take a look at the, the, the influence that these three groups make in the letters to the churches, what's interesting is we find that the first church, Ephesus, would have nothing to do with these people. Absolutely nothing. As a matter of fact, one of the things that our Lord commends the church at Ephesus for was, thou, but this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I, which I also hate. 
And so again, our Lord is commending them. You remember we said this. He is commending them for things that the world would condemn them for. And so the Nicolaitans had to go down the road. And they did go down the road. And they ended up at Pergamos. And they taught their doctrine there. And it's interesting because at Pergamos, we don't even see what we see in Thyatira. Pergamos, and this hurts me to say this, in Pergamos, the church, the pastor, the elders, like Christ says there, to the angel of the church, the leadership of the church, however you want to say it, they allowed in Pergamos individuals who held on to this teaching to be a part of the assembly. And you remember, like, it was, like I said, it wasn't like they were flirting with this doctrine. The scripture says they were holding to the doctrine. And so the leadership in the church saw that, knew that, and said, I don't know what they said, but they didn't say what was right. They didn't get them out of there. So they allowed it. So Ephesus wouldn't have anything to do with them. Pergamos allows them in the congregation. Come to Thyatira, and it's even worse. He says again, to the angel of the church of Thyatira, right. He says the things that are commendable. He begins his critique. I have this against thee, that thou, thou, the pastor, the elder, the leadership, thou sufferest that woman Jezebel to teach. You're allowing it. It's your responsibility to guard the flock. It's your responsibility to stand fast. It's your responsibility to protect the sheep that I have purchased with my own blood. And you have allowed this woman to teach and to seduce my servants to commit adultery and idolatry. You see, the, the focus in a very real sense comes upon the leadership of the church. And the failure to address these things was devastating on that church. And so our Lord Jesus Christ makes it very clear that there must be repentance from this. This idea of the pastoral responsibility in the congregation is, is brought out to us in so many places. One of the reasons that Paul addresses Titus in, in Titus chapter 1 is to lay before him the responsibilities and qualifications of, of pastoral leadership. You know the passage of Scripture, Titus 1, verses 6 through 16. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless, the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given the wine, no striker, not given the filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, holy, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. Holding fast the faithful word as he has been taught. For, men, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially them of the circumcision. Verse 11, whose mouths must be stopped, who subvert whole houses. Going on, coming down to verse 13. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. In other words, Paul says to Titus, you must ordain men to the ministry who will by way of spiritual strength, spiritual backbone, by way of the grace of God operative in them, stand against wickedness in whatever form it introduces itself. And to allow this kind of teaching, again, that was the point there in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, thou sufferest that woman Jezebel to teach. These things, again, go, go strike against the very calling of the minister. <clears throat> and so the failure in this case, as in many cases, was a failure of pastoral leadership. I remember years ago, at this point now, you know, I don't know, 40 years, my first pastor saying when he would observe the, the condition of, the, of, of, the, of, of society, he says, I blame the church. And his point was that if the church was preaching the gospels that ought to be preached, if the church was preaching men and women to live according to the call of Christ in the gospel, things would be different. So here we have this permission of Jezebel to teach. Well, what is, who was Jezebel and what did she teach? I think most people understand that Jezebel was not probably her actual name. She was just very similar to that Old Testament 
uh, oh, that, to that Old Testament disaster by the name of Jezebel, who seduced Israel into idolatry. So wicked was this woman, and so, and so, and, and so great was the failure of the king of Israel that the high mark of Ahab's failure was that he had married this woman Jezebel. Listen again, 1 Kings 21, <clears throat> verses, um, uh, verses 25 through 26. But there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of the Lord, whom his wife Jezebel stirred up. And he did very abominably, following idols, according to all things that the Amorites, whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. I just want to say a couple of things here. Number one, <laughs> number one, here was a man, Ahab, who, who paid... That man paid his way to hell. He sold himself to do evil. Wasn't bad enough that he was the victim of it, so to speak. Wasn't bad enough that he ended up in it. This man gave himself over to it. He committed, he committed himself wholeheartedly to it. And how many in our day are selling themselves to evil? The second thing I want you to see and understand here again is the fact that our Lord, that God marks out the, uh, the fact that this man Ahab and all the wickedness that he had, done, he had done, the crowning act of wickedness was marrying this woman Jezebel. And the effect of that was that she led the nation into idolatry. And what's, in, and what's important to see is this, notice, and they did very abominably uh, following the idols, listen, according to all the things that the Amorites did. And that's the challenge today. The challenge is that the church stays pure from all the things that society does or society allows for. How do we proceed here? How do we go forward? We emphasize what Christ calls us to. We ask God to give us grace to stay faithful to his word. And so when this woman Jezebel is mentioned in, in Revelation chapter 2, verses 20 and following, the reference now is not so much to her name, but to her activity. And what she was doing, as I said before, she was, she was teaching, she was probably one of the, she, she may have been one of the favorite teachers of the church of Thyatira. You ever think of that? Again, it wasn't just that she was someone in the congregation holding, she was teaching. And the pastor maybe would say on that one morning, oh, this morning we're going to have, we're going to have Jezebel teach for us this morning. And some of the people would have said, oh, she's, one of, she's my favorite one. You know, she's my favorite teacher in the church. And she would have gone up, gotten up. And what would she have said? She would have said things like this. Well, you know, you have to make a living in this world. You know, you have to support your family. You know, you have to, again, do things that will make sure that you have wherewithal for, for you and yours. And you need to remember, you know, that an idol is really nothing, and you know that. And so if you offer your sacrifice to the idol, and you know that idol is nothing, what harm does it do? Our Lord will have none of this. He will have none of this. What did she teach? Well, in a, in a, in a way that brings the whole issue close to home, she taught compromise, and by compromise I mean this, a setting aside of the commands of Christ, in order to avoid pressure and persecution from the larger society. A setting aside of the commands of Christ in order to avoid pressure and persecution from the larger society. And she said, listen, we can, we can do these things. These things are not detrimental or harmful to your faith. But rather, again, the teaching of Jezebel was, was deadly. The teaching of Jezebel was something that our Lord Jesus Christ would not countenance. The teaching of Jezebel, again, was so dangerous to that congregation that our Lord says in verses 21 and 22 the following, And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them to commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. I want you to see at least two things here. Number one, I want you to see how severely Christ, te how, how severely Christ touches upon this whole idea of compromise in order to avoid this pressure. You remember me saying before a couple weeks ago, you may flee persecution, but you must not flee from Christ. You may flee, per you may flee persecution. This building right now is threatened to be burned because of a 
uh, an angry mob outside. You have every right to make your way out of this place. But you have no right to flee from Christ as a follower of Jesus Christ. You see the distinction between the two. And so these things, again, are set before us here. Our Lord Jesus Christ, again, calling us to this kind of commitment. But I want you to notice something here. Do you notice the patience of Christ in the face of all this? I gave her space to repent. I gave her this opportunity. And my brothers and sisters, when you, when you come together in the name of Christ and you hear the word of God being preached, the gospel is set before you, the promises of God are set before you, the, the, the longing of Christ for your soul is set before you. You see, this is where, where Christ has given you space to repent. Whatever our sins are, we need not stay in our sins. Christ will give us space to repent. And again, even in verse 22 there, I will cast, them into a, I will cast her into a bed with with them that commit adultery with her and to great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. Christ is holding out this offer of repentance. Well, here is this woman then, Jezebel. Here is this message that our Lord Jesus Christ gives to the church. Now, next week we'll come back and we'll look at the things that are commendable. We'll touch on them. We'll look at some of the specifics, again, of going on as to how he gives great promises to those who overcome. We'll deal with all these things. But the reason why I wanted to focus on this element this morning was, was, was twofold. Number one, because of the, the, how pressing this challenge is to us, number one. But also because I, I want to use this as an opportunity to make an invitation to the table of the Lord. This table is a table that Christ sets before you. This table is a table whereby your participation in it designates you and marks you off as a true follower of Jesus Christ. It marks you out before a watching world that you truly are a follower of the one who has given his blood in order that you might be saved. And then, and, and because of that, I want you to understand that not only do, by way of this invitation to the table, I want you to understand that if the, if the teaching of Jezebel, the Nicolaitans, and, uh, the doc, and, and those who teach the doctrine of Balaam, if, if, this, if that teaching permeates a church, what ends up happening is that you leave, you expose souls to great danger. You expose souls not only to the danger of the judgment of Christ upon them by way of chastening, hopefully to bring the repentance. If repentance fails, again, judgment. But you also, you also leave open the possibility that there will be those who hear preaching, so-called, and they think that they will be able to remain in their sin and not be faithful to Christ. You know how oftentimes we're warned against deception. 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11, you know the passage. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Listen, neither fornicators nor idolaters. Well, this was the very th these were the very issues that these churches were dealing with. These were the very things that, the, that, that these false teachers were allowing. They were making accommodation in the life of the Christian for participation in idolatry and immorality. And Christ says these things are not to be. And the Apostle Paul says, be careful that you don't be seduced or deceived by these things. And in order, if I can say it this way, in order that that truth is protected in the church and in the congregation, Christ himself calls the messenger of the church, the angel of the church, the elder of the church, the, the, uh, the pastor of the church, to set before the congregation and the people of God these things concerning Christ. So my brothers and sisters, I know that this is a very, very challenging passage of scripture that is in front of us here today. And I'm sure that there are ways that I could have, I could have approached this text to not bring this out in the kind of bold relief that I have. But my brothers and sisters, I'll be very honest with you. I'm fearful when I read passages of Scripture like this. I'm fearful when I read of passages of Scripture where, where our Lord Jesus Christ shows up to a, a church and addresses the pastor or addresses the elder, addresses the messenger, and says, Thou sufferest that woman. Thou sufferest that teaching. But this is a gospel church. 
And there's a gospel invitation to you. And that gospel invitation says to all who will all who will walk and all who will believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, a table is open to them. You might say, I live in a day where the, if I don't swear allegiance to the emperor, I'll lose my life. You might say, I live in a day where if I don't swear allegiance to some petty, to some petty uh, 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 God, I'll lose my job. Do, do you hear the words of Christ in Psalm 23? Thou settest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Well, that's this table right here. And all of you, all of us, who love the Lord Jesus Christ and who want to be identified with the Lord Jesus Christ in this corrupt age, come to this table. Come with self-examination. Come with repentance. Come with rejoicing. Come with determination. But come. Our Father and our God, grant that your word may penetrate our souls. Grant that we might hear what you intend for us to hear. And give us grace to be your people, Lord God, until you return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.